Hello everyone and welcome to MTC's second in the series webinar on supply chain business not as usual. Thank you for joining us today. <clears throat> I'm Neil Smith, I head up the Manufacturing Support Services and I will be chairing the webinar today. The Manufacturing Support Service is the customer facing the arm of the Manufacturing Technology Centre, reaching out to manufacturers to understand their challenges and using the expertise of the Manufacturing Technology Center to solve these. We will be running a short video at the end of the webinar summarizing this. <clears throat> but before we start, I would like to run through some housekeeping with you. First of all, can I remind you the session is being recorded so it can be viewed at a later date on the MTC YouTube channel. You can revisit the content or share with colleagues. Details of this and other information relevant to the webinar will be shared with you in a follow-up email after this event. For the purpose of the webinar, you, the audience, will be in listening mode only with videos and mics turned off. Your viewing options can be adjusted by clicking on the view options tab, which is positioned at the top of your screen. Using a drop-down menu, you can either show or hide the video panel. During the webinar, we'll be inviting you to ask questions using the Q&A function, which is located at the bottom of your screen. Your questions will be answered by our speakers at specific intervals during the webinar. We will try, and try to answer as many as possible, but due to time constraints, we may have to be selective. If you're using the chat function, please note that your comments will be visible for everyone to see. And you can please share anything on social media if you wish. Okay, in today's webinar, which we expect to last about 45 minutes, we have two speakers, Steve Smith and Sai Kyo. Both work in the business transformation team. Steve has over 15 years leadership experience gained from senior positions in the aerospace, automotive, power generation, defense, motorsport, and consulting sectors. In doing so, Steve had worked with all business sizes of business from SMEs to large multinationals. <clears throat> an accomplished lean practitioner with an expertise in business transformation, strategy, and cultural change. He has a proven track record of helping organizations, senior teams, and leaders enhance performance by implementing best practices and developing mindsets, values, and behaviors that support their business strategies. Moving on to Sai Kyo. Uh, Sai started his affair with supply chain resilience in 2008 when designing and delivering development supply chain programs for major firms in the Middle East, whilst working as a visiting lecturer at Kawarizmi. International College in Abu Dhabi. Before joining the MTC three years ago, he worked for Pira and the West Midlands Manufacturing Consortium. An accredited master coach and IE mentor, he has worked independently as a process efficiency engineer and project manager for 25 years, and was owner and manager of a tier two aero automotive engineering manufacturer for six years. A biochemist by profession, he has an MBA from Manchester Business School and he has published work on entrepreneurship in the Journal of Innovation and Technology. So I'm just going to run through today's agenda. So <clears throat> uh, the, the uh, title of the uh, webinar is Supply Chain Business Not As Usual, where we want to help you think strategically about reviewing your supply chain and then how, with the use of an assessment tool, understands what's needed to make it more resilient and we will be including some case study examples in this. The two presentations will follow a brief introduction to the MTC and catapult centers. So the first presentation, which is business, uh, supply chain business not as usual, uh, we'll talk about what supply uh, changing your supply chain, advice and support, and then we'll follow that with a Q&A session. Then we'll go on to the second presentation, the MTC supply chain readiness level assessment uh, talk about robustness versus resilience, the uh, supply chain readiness level assessment tool, and, and again, followed by a Q&A session. And then we'll finish that with a brief video of the manufacturer support service, the free assessment offer, and finishing with an exit poll. So who are the MTC? Well, we're one of the seven high value manufacturing catapult centers uh, based in the UK. Um, our remit is to make British industry more competitive on a world scale. So we are 800 strong in people, of which 500 are engineers. 
and we're all about helping manufacturers improve quality cost and delivery performance. We will help, help you identify new technologies and innovations to help you with your business and also help you de-risk those investments. We provide technical support to all sizes of companies from the small SME to the large multinationals. Okay, I want then to uh, hand over now to Steve Smith. Thank you very much for the introduction, Neil. Um, as Neil said, I'll be doing the first part of this webinar before I hand over to my colleague, uh, Sai Kion. I'm going to take you through a little bit about why we're talking about supply chains now and a little bit about strategy that might help you improve. So why are we here? Uh, not a philosophical question about the meaning of life. Uh, we'll reference this webinar. Um, the likely reason is concerns over COVID-19. Um, fortunately, we don't have a solution for COVID-19. Um, however, um, if you're looking at uh, reducing vulnerability of your business, whether you're a purchaser or a supplier, um, we're going to offer you some uh, practical methods to assess risks and help some, uh, develop some strategies that might help you through this uh, crisis and any future ones. Okay, I think the important thing to know about this crisis is we all knew it was coming. Um, not COVID-19 necessarily, um, but some crisis or some event. On the left hand side, you can see a list of world events that have happened over the past two decades. Um, all of these have affected problems with businesses and particularly with supply chains. Um, the interesting thing is this list isn't exhaustive and COVID-19 certainly won't be the last. Okay, so everyone on this webinar probably works for a business that has survived and possibly even thrived during all these previous events. Um, so why change because of this one? Well, each business would have been affected differently by each crisis. Um, with COVID-19, each business will be affected differently now. However, every one of the events that were listed on a previous slide resulted in previously sustainable and profitable businesses going bust. Simply put, those who do not adapt to the new environment may not survive. As well, it's worth mentioning, you're only strong as your supply chain. Though it's relatively early in this crisis, um, it's evidence already points to companies who understand their supply chain faring better in recovery. And as the saying goes, the supply chain is only strong as its weakest link. It's important um, to know that things that made you successful as a supplier in the past may not be what is needed now. If we look back at typical supply chain last year, we may see some recurring characteristics. Often long-term supplier agreements are in place with well-established KPIs. Now these KPIs were well known by suppliers um, and often suppliers have found a way to regularly achieve high scores on these, often at the detriment of their own business. A good example would be on-time delivery in full as a measure. Um, this could be achieved with high levels of work in progress and high cost of finished goods stocks. Um, neither of which make a, uh, a successful long-term uh, business. Uh, typically though, it was a known working environment um, of a stable platform um, and often gave companies longer lead times for new product reduction. Um, but purchasing, we're looking at offshoring to maximise some cost benefits, so it wasn't all good news. If we fast forward to COVID-19 um, supply chain, how it looks now, um, with supply chains failing, there's an opportunity to be able to get more work if you can build short-term relationships built on trust and compromise. Um, and certainly less time to do any complex contract negotiations. Um, overseas logistics have caused problems, uh, speed of supply issues, flexibility of quantities and risky complexity. So work may now be coming back from overseas through reshoring and onshoring to ensure um, the control of security of supply and uh, mitigate the unknown risk of imports uh, and potential country lockdowns. Um, for businesses, you need to be agile, flexible, and mobility is now critical. Suppliers need to be both resilient and robust. Uh, my colleague Sai will explain this in more detail later. Um, though it's fair to say it's a constantly changing world, it's an unstable platform. But things like the ventilator challenge has shown that the suppliers um, who react much faster with little or no lead time um, are likely to win more work and that, as I've already said, there is an increase in opportunities for those who can adapt quickly to support the reshoring and onshoring.
I've tried to simplify the, the, the problems um, in three simple steps. Um, the first step is about understanding your business. So what are you good at? What are your strengths and weaknesses? Um, and how do you fare as a link in your supply chain? Um, and what part of your business makes you resilient? Now, my colleague Sai will talk about that in more detail and how you can understand that. Um, the next step I've put down is about strategy. No doubt all of your businesses have got strategies that have fared well. Um, however, with a complete change in the, uh, the, the market after COVID-19, you'll need to do some more strategic thinking. And the strategies might be a little bit more um, unusual or challenging than, than previous strategies have been. So I'm going to go through some slides, uh, three slides that offer some good strategic tools shortly. A uh, key thing is don't neglect culture when thinking of strategy. Uh, Peter Drucker has got a good quote that I often use. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. And that's really important. Your strategy can be fantastic, but if your culture is not right, you won't be able to implement it. And the third thing I've put down is, to, is maximize. This is about trying to get the most out of your business. Implementation of best practice can be one of the most effective ways of reducing costs. Reducing costs in your business is a very important thing to do now. A downturn typically unveils ineffective and broken processes. Um, but also as well, when you were busier, you may have had processes you knew needed changing, but you didn't have sufficient time to do it. The key thing on maximize is only spend money and energy on things that are actually going to make a difference for where you are now. So typically focus around things that are going to make you faster to market, quicker on new product introduction, more flexible. Now, there's many strategy tools out there. It's a vast subject in its own right. Um, I'm starting with a lesser used tool um, called Scenario Analysis. Um, we should help you through crisis. Um, hopefully some of, of this crisis, but certainly the next one that comes. Um, the initial step is you identify some discrete possible outcomes. There should be plausible yet distinct possibilities. You map and describe what the outcomes are. Evaluate how you would fare against these outcomes. And then you create a plan of what you would do. The important thing is the strategic plans don't necessarily need to be implemented, but you need to know what the trigger is that would tell you you need to actually implement your plan. So if we look at COVID-19, um, tail end of uh, December, early January, there was news in the, uh, in the media about this potential virus. They hadn't named it at that point, but the virus was known. Um, China went in lockdown a month before the UK did, Italy two weeks. So there were triggers that could have been seen and monitored. If, um, if a plan was uh, ready to, to launch, it certainly could have been launched in time. As a tool, scenario analysis can be high in cost of time, um, but high rewards. Um, again, the more scenarios you cover, the more likely you will predict the next crisis. It's important um, with strategy to, to consider culture. I've already raised this one earlier, uh, but to be successful, a company needs to have a well-developed strategy and an imp implementation plan on how to execute the strategy. Um, the uh, four hurdles were um, identified in Blue Ocean Strategy, which is a, a marketing theory book written by uh, Rennie uh, Moorberg and uh, Chan Kim. What I like about the, uh, the hurdles, it identifies four blockers, potential blockers to a strategy that may hinder successful deployment. Cognitive hurdle, this is an organisational culture stuck on a status quo. So this is an internal facing one. Um, this is the people that are unwilling to change, are willing to rock the boat. Resource hurdle, um, limited or lack of resources. This is either in the amount of staff, the skills of staff, or even the finances, uh, particularly COVID-19, if you've got furloughed staff, this could be something you're suffering with. So you've got to be aware of it and actually um, how you, uh, how you ut best utilise your staff in achieving it. Um, the greater the shift in strategy, the greater resources needed. Motivational hurdle. Um, for any um, strategic deployment, urgency is important. So unmotivated staff. Um, are a real, uh, a real problem area. Um, and political hurdle, and the political hurdle can refer to both internal and external politics. 
So if you think external, there's plenty of political um, things that, uh, that can keep you busy, but internally as well, any significant shift in an organization will result in an internal shift in, in the power. Um, so there will be people that don't necessarily want to, to change. It's important that both um, strategy creation tools and operational deployment tools are used. So this will help you identify risks, but uh, it's important to use tools such as Ocean Canary, uh, X Matrix, uh, VMOST, or a balanced scorecard to help um, deploy the uh, strategy into your business. As a supplier, you may come to the conclusion that you need to find alternative customers or embrace some uh, the potential opportunities of onshoring or reshoring. Um, I've uh, picked a very simple tool. It's been around for a long time. So the initial four P's came from uh, E. Jerome McCarthy's basic marketing back in 1960, but it's still relevant to this day. It talks about the price, the product, the place, and the promotion. Um, three P's were later added back in 1981 by Booms and Bittner. Um, this focused very much more on servicing. So if you're in a service sector, it talks about your people, physical evidence of what you do and the processes. Um, these, these tools are very good um, to help you position your product and service in the market. Um, it can be used to create different strategies for different targets. Um, th these strategic tools I've shown you aren't the only ones. I just think there are three uh, ones that should help your business at this time. So are there any questions before I hand you over to my colleague, Saikion, for the next stage? Uh, Steve, well, the um, audiences have been a little bit uh, shy in coming forward um, today. So um, I've got a few questions for you, Steve, if you don't mind. Yeah, far away. Okay. Um, on the three steps you talked about, for the third step, you mentioned maximize. How do we know which areas we need to improve? Um, yes, yeah, so it's a really good question because... Uh, if, if you're looking at improving the uh, areas of your business that don't actually uh, help you immediately, um, you're just going to be spending a lot of money and tying up a lot of your resources that could be better spent. Um, the tool Soy uh, talks about is a, is a very good tool to help identify, um, but, but there are certainly uh, other tools out there that can help you. But, but typically, if you're focusing on things that help um, immediately improve either your direct strategy to where you're looking to get your product um, or actually um, speed up your processes or remove costs. They're the important areas to focus. Okay, thank you. And you talked quite a lot about culture in, in your presentation. Um, and cultures are difficult sometimes to get right in a company, particularly, you know, um, depends on the profile, the age profile of the company as well. Um, what does a good culture look like to you? Yeah, so uh, a good culture, um, you, you, want, uh, um, you want your team to really be doing, the, they want to be fully empowered and they want to be driving this. Um, that sense of urgency that's needed, um, ideally should be driven by uh, many people in your organization. The more people that are driving change, the more successful you'll be. It's key to make sure if you have got a switched on um, uh, sort of, positive culture like that, you make sure it's focused in the right areas. So the deployment strategy tools I talked about earlier, the Hoshin Canary X matrix, uh, mm -hmm. VMOST and the balanced scorecard are good ways of getting people to focus on the right strategic changes and communicating it. Um, okay. Communication is a real key area in cultural change. Uh, be honest with your employees, um, particularly times like this. If you're looking at moving away from a particular sector to another one, Tell them the reason, what are the opportunities in the other sector? Um, if people buy into your vision, um, they can really drive the changes for you. Okay, thanks, Steve. And uh, I've got uh, actually a question just come in. Um, question is, hi, Steve. Can you tell, me, tell us more about tactical activities and strategic planning and how they link? Um, yeah, so... Um, uh, it's, it's quite a long conversation, but uh, certainly with the uh, strategic um, uh, elements, uh, the key bit um, is actually identifying that, uh, you know, where do you actually want to get to? Um, that, that's the key bit of the strategy. 
Um, there should always be at least three steps. Um, one, you should be looking internally and externally for creating strategy. Um, it's key to look at what's changing externally, um, but also um, what your strengths and weaknesses. Um, so some particularly good simple tools to use is SWOT. Um, identify your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. If you couple that with PESTLE, um, the political, economic, social, technological, legal and environmental, um, it gives you a really good framework to, to sort of start the, uh, the understanding of, of the areas of business that you can look at. Um, you then very much need to focus internally on, on the hurdles, the blockers, the things that you need to do and the perception and how you market that externally. So the important thing with strategy, it's not just an internal tool, um, and it's not just a marketing tool, it, it really is a fusion of making sure that you've got a strategic tool that gives you the vision and steers you in the right direction, but that's, that's no good if you're not able to market it. Okay, thank you then, Steve. Um, right, that's enough of the questions for the time being. We'll be taking some more questions at once Sai uh, finishes presentation. So Sai Keo now is going to talk to you about the MTC Supply Chain Readiness Level Assessment. Over to you then, Sai. Okay, very good morning to you all out there in webinar land. It says there, my name's Sai Keo. Uh, Odd looking name. Uh, I was a fourth century Irish prince, but unfortunately I'm not named after him. I was named after a horse on the day that won. Uh, and it's strange that because the name Keo in Celtic means the horse keeper. I have to say I don't know a great deal about horses, but uh, I do know a fair bit about supply chains. As Neil said, I've been associated with uh, supply chains since 2008. And there was a slide that um, uh, Steve put up, which catalogued a number of disasters that have occurred over the last two decades. And on there was a financial crisis of 2008. And I was working for a number of firms in the Middle East then, and we were put under a great deal of pressure by uh, elements of our supply chain on which we were massively reliant, suffering from this particular incident. And what you'll have also noticed is something happens roughly every two to three years. So at the time, I was trying to educate my clients about having a two-pronged strategy towards uh, meeting the unexpected events that occur with something like COVID-19 as has just happened. Right, well, robustness and resilience, two key elements of what I'm talking about today. And what are they? What's the difference for a start? And why are they important, particularly at a time like now? As you can see, there's an illustration there, Muhammad Ali. It's a graphic illustration. It's not a perfect illustration, but it's near enough. And it, and it uh, gives you a good indication of what the difference between the two is. Robustness is how, how much can you take before you fall down? You know, how, how, how hard can you take a punch? Uh, and resilience, as it says, is how long does it take you to get back up again? Now, there's a, there's, there's a point about that, and, it, and it's simply this. Um, robustness is a kind of, it's an operational reaction. There was a question before about what's the link between strategy and tactics. My, my answer to that would be um, you need to address both the operational element, which is robustness, and the strategic element, which is resilience. And you might use a technique uh, like Hoshin Canary and policy deployment matrix for that because it allows you to convert strategy into action. Hopefully, the example I'm going to give you with the assessment today is one way in which you can do that. So we've got a more technical. Uh, definition of robustness and resilience here. Robust systems can continue functioning in the presence of internal and external challenges without fundamental change. So what that means is it's a kind of fortress mentality. Yeah, uh, what you're doing is you're putting things in place that will anticipate shocks so that you can react to them. Now that's precisely what I was doing in 2008. We were assessing likely risks calculating what the probability of those risks occurring, working out what the impact cost would be to the business, and then putting some kind of operational um, response to that to try and shore up against that eventuality. Two simple examples would be, for instance, uh, the use of uh, dual supply, dual sourcing, so that if we lose one supply, we've got another one. A simple, another one would be we buy a new machine, which is more productive than the previous one we had, but we keep the old one until we've got full understanding of the new one in case there's any interruption in supply. So we're sort of hedging our bets. 
So that's a very operational response. However, what happens if you can't predict the risk? You need a strategic approach. And at the same time that I was putting in uh, the robust approach into clients, I was also leading a strategic team. Uh, I was Actually, I was known as Napoleon, and it was absolutely nothing to do with the great French leader. Uh, it was more to do with George Orwell and the animal farm, because I had three teams of people called pigs, cats, and rats operated in the business. And that was the process improvement group, the pigs, the corrective action team, the cats, and the rapid action team. And they were sort of engineering an operational and a commercial response team. So that if a customer, for instance, came on and they had an urgent require for, for ex extra products, we had a dedicated SWAT team able to march that through the business. Similarly, if we had a, a quality issue, we had a team of lads trained up on the operational side to deal with that. And we had an engineering team who were constantly looking at improved ways that we could do business. That's a more strategic approach. And that's more about resilience than it is about robustness. Point is, you've got to do both. And this diagram illustrates that exactly. I actually took this diagram from uh, a paper I read back in 2008. It was actually this guy's Tom Pettit's PhD submission. And what it illustrates there, you will face a number of vulnerabilities in the business. Uh, according to MIT, there, there are six of these things. Uh, and they vary from external shocks to, um, you know, uh, changes in the ups and downs of business, the changes of of uh, business environment generally and you need some kind of reaction to that but you don't want to overreact you want capabilities within the business that enable you to meet these external challenges so that you can build up your resilience the reason it's a balance is explained on the next diagram yeah we've got a balance between external disruptive forces that create vulnerabilities in an organization and the degree to which you can react and as i said We've got these external vulnerabilities, turbulence, um, deliberate threats, could be COVID-19, for instance, or, or terrorist threats. External pressures could be innovation. Somebody come up with a better product than yours, and you've got to react to that quickly. It could be resource limitations. You might not have the people or the finances to pursue what you want to do on a strategic level. Or it could be sensitivity. In other words, you've got a, an, an important part of your supply chain that... Um, if they catch a cold, you get pneumonia. That's a good way of putting it. Uh, and I'll illustrate that by saying, I built a plant once for a company um, and we'd almost finished it. And the M I handed over the, to the MD and he said, okay, that's job well done. We should be okay for the next 10 years. And I said, well, not quite. I said, I've noticed that you've got one particular important product that you're buying on a regular basis. There are only two suppliers in the world. One is in Japan and they've just been acquired by your major competitor. And the other is in Bolton and they had a fire last week. So you now have a major issue. And actually that led to another piece of work in that business where we actually brought in the manufacturer of that raw material internally to ensure that we had some strategic response to that. What this little diagram shows is <laughs> you don't want to overdo it. Yeah, there's a lot of capabilities you can invest in as a company but you haven't got an infinite number of resources. And if you, if you attack the capability end without consideration of which vulnerabilities are actually relevant to your business, you could end up eroding all your profits, you go bust. Yeah? Similarly, if you don't react, the vulnerabilities will get you uh, and you'll, you'll expire on the basis that a risk will take you out. So you wanna be in that green zone, the middle zone there. The way to say it is you wanna make an appropriate response. Yeah. So how, why, how might you do that? Well, let's see how. We've been working with, in MTC, with many companies on supply chain. I've been associated with the MTC now for three years. And the names there that resonate with me, Network Rail, Siemens, Pattern Air, uh, and recently been involved in supply chain tools for the construction hub, particularly with the manufacture of modular buildings. It's actually the Network Rail example that I chose to illustrate um, the assessment tool today because not only does it apply to your supply chain but it, it's also a useful tool for you to use on your own business so here it is the MTC supply chain readiness assessment just a little word about how this thing uh, arose 
in uh, in March of last year, we sort of collaborated with a guy called Paul Moropoulos at Queen's University in Belfast, and we looked at what supply chain measures are there out in the in the industry, and there is a plethora of them. We we found nine, uh, just and that's without much looking, and we thought, why are all these different models? Why could we not? encapsulate what's being measured in all these different models and have one fairly simple to use model that we could use so it doesn't matter what sector what industry what project you're looking at you could just use this tool and it will give you a measure of your capabilities the strength of your supply chain and also you could extend that down into your supply chain to remove some of these vulnerabilities and what we came up with it says there is we identified eight or nine threads uh, there's eight written on that uh, screen there the reason we'd have nine is in there are certain circumstances where you've got a, a new business or a very high growth business where we would ask us a few extra questions that we wouldn't normally associate with a well-established business and for each of these eight threads there are five special questions that we would ask so we've got there eight fives forty so this is a 40 question uh, appraisal and what we'd ask you to do for each of those questions is to assess what you think your business which level you think your business has achieved so this is a maturity level question it's kind of like multiple choice yeah so we as it, and it says there we've got four levels one two three and four and we brand those awareness understanding advanced and expert there's a different way of looking at that for if you're doing this on your supply chain a level one supplier would be a transactional supplier highly operational a good example of that for instance would be rs components or amazon in other words you just place an order and the stuff arrives next day but there's no real interaction they provide a good service but that's the limit of it so it's highly operational at the opposite end of that you've got an alliance where a company that you rely on as a supplier are integrated into your business they have the same systems you do some concurrent engineering with them um, you know you share information they give you as much uh, information about your supply chain decisions as, as as you supply them so it's a real alliance and along that track you're moving from an operational standpoint to a strategic from transactional to a preferred supplier status then to a partnership where there's some shared risk and some sharing of information but perhaps the systems aren't as well integrated as they might be to this alliance phase where basically your suppliers are an extension of your business uh, and what, what, what that does is now we've got 40 questions, we've got four levels of choice, and all you do is you choose one of these levels for each of those 40. And what does that give you? Well, I said I'd choose an example to illustrate that to you. And this is the example done on 17 suppliers of network rail. And the reason 17 is because they were chosen as, uh, as a representative example from a batch of 500 but you know there is a thing called Pareto rule 80 20 rule these 17 suppliers account for something like 65 percent of controlled products and 90 percent of uncontrolled in network rail what does that mean well a controlled product is a product that if it's not in the right place at the right time it will stop the train so these are highly important suppliers first thing you'll notice of course is that that's, that graph is not exactly kind of level they're, they're, they're all over the place and you'll notice as well that the four levels marked on there the red line and the yellow and the amber and the green at the top the green at the top represents the aspiration for network rail that's where they want their suppliers to be that's kind of the top draw it's where everybody scores a level four on that 40 questions so they get 10 points because we grade each of the responses one three seven and ten maximum score 400 and what you'll see there is nobody has actually achieved that and here's some of the uh, conclusions we draw from that graph First of all, as I said, scores vary widely. Yeah, there's no supplier, number two, there's no supplier at level four. So in other words, there's no trendsetter, there's no role model for the rest of the suppliers to follow. And what's more, we've got a supply base where we've set an aspiration and nobody's actually meeting it. However, most suppliers are above two and level two is understanding. So what does that mean? It's, it means our suppliers understand where they need to be, but they've got some way to go they, and, they, and they may need some help yeah so that that suggests that we might put in place some kind of development program to assist them on that uh, on that journey 
number five there it says we've got three suppliers at level two now that means that they've got low levels of confidence low levels of integration one reaction to that might be well we'll, we'll get rid of them we'll, we'll, we'll replace them with a different supplier these are not we're not measuring technical competence in this assessment we're measuring strategic and operational capability all these folks know what they're doing they're all providing a good product and, and it's critical to the success of network rail however some of them the systems don't match and the way in which they do business doesn't match their technical capability we don't want to get rid of them what we want to do is put a foundation in place as it says number five there to try and get them up to the level because nobody is at level four the green line what it suggests is and number six is the point there we might want to set level three as initial target for all the suppliers is, is a, a re-representation of those results that actually Network Rail never even thought about. And all we've done here is reordered all the 17 sets of results, so they fall into three groupings. Uh, the ones on the left-hand side are uh, those who are completely diversified companies. They don't only deal in the rail industry, they're in automotive, energy, aerospace in some cases. Uh, they have highly sophisticated supply chain mechanisms and systems. They're used to being asked for uh, data transfer, integration. Not surprisingly, therefore, in this capability assessment, uh, they score quite highly. Op oppositely, if you look on the right-hand side, you'll see the, sky the scores are somewhat more lower. And that group on the right-hand side are wholly dependent on network rail. They are a one customer company and guess where the low scores are down there so that suggests that network rail needs to invest some some time and effort in getting these suppliers up into the 21st century in the middle group there you've got a group who recognize the risk of being associated with one customer so they have diversified but they consider themselves to be rail people so they've ra they've diversified within the same sector so their scores are better but not as good as the fully diversified group. Now, this represents a risk at both ends for this company. Yeah. So the ones on the right represent a risk because they're wholly dependent on you. And if you run out of work, they go bust. That's as simple as that. And remember, they're making critical products. However, the ones on the left hand side, they're busy. They've got other customers in other industries. So you're not as important to them as you may like to be. So you may go to them with an urgent order and they just haven't got the capacity to deliver. They can put the capacity in place, but that adds cost. And that again is a risk. I also pick these out with particular re relevance to what we're talking about today, which is resilience. Um, 11 out of the 40 questions in this particular survey more than 50% of the responses were at level one or two. In other words, there was a low level of confidence in about a quarter of the replies, which suggests there's a long way to go to develop capability in this particular group. And I picked these three out because as it says there, we've got sustainability of supply. What's the subthread? What's the question? Well, the key thing is that in that question is, have you are you exposed to critical suppliers? And the answer is yes. And in that case, we've got 11 people at level two. So that they've got low levels of confidence in their own supply chain. And remember, if you've got good relationships with your suppliers, but they have got dodgy supply chains, then if those supply chains fail, that problem is passed on to you. Yeah. The second one there, it says fit in the supply chain value stream. There's a lot of value tied up in, in, uh, in uh, uh, supply chains which which is accessible if you get the right systems in place it doesn't necessarily mean that people are charging you more than they ought to it means that because there's a mismatch between the way in which you do business handing over information integrating of systems digital data you're paying more because the systems are adding costs to the system to, to the process and what you'll see there we've got nine in level one three in level two so that's 12 out of 17 low levels of confidence for that kind of response value chains they, they don't understand what value streams are so one of the things we would do is we say right we need to educate these folks and the last one is the most frightening one at all because the last one is about i4.0 which is a, it's a, they're coming at us rapidly it's about the use of data the collection and processing of data and as you'll see there nine at level one uh sorry seven at level one nine at level two so that's 16 out of 17 suppliers are not ready for I4.0. That's a huge risk. 
what you also get from this assessment is a pictorial view of what your capabilities are. So we've got eight areas of capability, and I particularly picked this one. It's one of the diversified suppliers on that uh, group there, and they are particularly good. Yeah, and as you can see, we've got good scores, nice big pattern, possibly a little bit of work to do on the organization and governance area, but generally speaking, this is a good company and it gets a map. The purpose of this map is to very quickly focus you to those areas that you might want to look at some of the work that Steve was talking about in terms of addressing your strategy. However, you remember when we started off, we talked about resilience and robustness. And at the time that I was doing this piece of work, which was actually in December last year, we, had, we were talking to Queen's University Belfast. And when COVID took off, we were contacted by them again and they said, okay, guess what? We've looked at resilience. Resilient companies are the ones who are gonna come out of this um, issue that we've got with COVID-19 in a strong position. And we've identified, we've looked at all sorts of pieces of uh, academia and we've come up with six factors which will affect the survival, the resilience of companies. And these factors are digital competence, strategy, supply intimacy, that's the degree to which you are integrated into your supply chain, sustainability, that's, op that's having good robustness, assessing risks, putting operational plans in place so that when things happen you're ready for them, the ability to switch quickly, that's more strategic, agility, and finally, system standards and procedures. Here's the thing, uh, Queen's University Belfast has said to us, in your assessment, the assessment that we've developed to the NTC, all these six factors are already tested in that assessment. And what that means is we can reassess the data and we can come up with a resilience quotient. Now this is the same company you saw before, we were measuring the eight levels of capability, but now we're just measuring resilience. We're reinterpreting the data to look at resilience and you get a high figure here, 78%, that's a good score for resilience, yeah? But also we get a measure between the approach taken by the company uh, between strategic and operational, and which is, operate, which is robustness and resilience. And what it says there, this is high resilience, high robustness. In other words, they're taking a balanced view. And just to put that into, context if you look at this company it's a very different picture yeah you can see from the map there are some areas where there are significant weaknesses that need address this company's got a 57 percent quotient and what you'll see at the bottom is low resilience medium robustness in other words they've got some operational measures in place but they're not really paying much attention to the strategy what they need to do of course is listen to steve's presentation Okay, thank you, Si. I'm glad I back you each way. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> That's what Dad used to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but before we, before you uh, trot off to the stables, Si, um, I've got some uh, questions for you. We've had none from the floor. They're rich shy today. Um, <laughs> but um, one of the slides you talked about some of the su supply chain uh, projects that we've done at the MTC, Heller, uh, Patanair, Network Rail, Siemens. Yeah. Um, where in some cases, you know, the MTC has been almost handed responsibility for, for um, structuring that supply chain and, 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 and improving it. Uh, mm -hmm. In your opinion, Si, what, what have we learned from those um, supply chain initiatives that we've already done? I think what we've learned is that, you know, it's, it's a two-way uh, process, this is. Um, you've got to work with your supply chains initially on some of them it was almost you'd people would do assessments which the best way I could describe to you is that the assessments they were doing uh, were kind of functional you know like have they got the right QA systems and whatever it's a ticks box exercise this, this is a lot more than that this is a more of a capability and engagement process you saw some of the results that came out in there they're not necessarily good results but what it's saying to us is um, it's going to require investment on both sides that's that's the big message yeah okay and um, me, me being a very patriotic uh, British man um, <laughs> And uh, with the, seeing the devastation to supply chains with the COVID-19 um, uh, crisis, yeah. um, if I was a, a local company who, who had built their supply chain up on, on the foreign imports, 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I want to I want to try and build locally. What's the best way of doing that? And what I'm worried about is if if we look towards Europe, is we've got Brexit, um, the effect of Brexit, and some of these trade deals are still not in place. Yeah. Um, you know, how 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 you know how, can we can we build the supply chain locally? Do you think? I think we can. Uh, I mean, I have to say to some of my clients, I mean, thank God for Brexit, because obviously when Brexit was thrown at us, uh, people's reaction to that is, oh, we better get some stock in. Uh, just in case there's any interruption in the European supply. And then, of course, what happens is along comes COVID and uh, and it's a good job they did have some supply because otherwise they would have been snookered. Yeah, um, it's a, obviously there's been a focus in recent times to move supply chains, that maybe the Far East or China because of price and concentration, stuff mm -hmm. like that. Uh, yeah, but that that to me is as a definition of robustness. That's that's an operational approach. Yeah, strategically, we've got to do a bit of both. We've got to look locally, and you know, there's there's some firms out in in the uk now they've got the ability to repurpose they've got the right skills they've got the right pieces of kit they're just waiting for people to knock on their door i'm i'm pretty sure that um, uk plc certainly i know one company for instance when we did the work on siemens siemens are actively looking for uk suppliers yeah. at the moment yeah and their view is that they're there we just need to bring them up to the necessary level mm -hmm. um well we've been uh, discussing this uh, so we've had a couple of questions from the floor Okay. Um, <laughs> Normally the case, yeah, yeah. So we'll take, we've I'll, got I'll two questions. Go. Yeah, go. we'll have we've got two more two questions, and I think we'll have yes. to move on. But um, right. first question okay. is: Does your analysis look at tier one suppliers, or does it also look further into the network tier two and beyond? The, the, the what I, I would say about this analysis: you can do it on your own company. You know, you can be an SME, you can be a tier one, you can do the assessment on yourself, but then you can hand it down the chain. And the example I gave you, Network Rail, obviously Network Rail are right at the top of the chain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but the assessment was not just done on them. It was done on critical suppliers within them. So you can run the assessment at different levels. And actually, uh, if you integrate the learning from that, it will tell you a great deal about the supply chain, chain structure in your business. Okay. Um, and we've got another question here. Really interesting finds on dependent suppliers. Do you, do you have any quick win tips for companies who find themselves in that position? Where are they best to start? Um, right, I'm trying to understand that question. So do you um, want to repeat that for you? Yeah, go, go, really, go. So there's some, the, the, the comment was there's some, been some really interesting findings on on the dependent suppliers. Yes. All oh, right. I've got you. Yeah, right. The yeah. ones at the the ones on the right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, yeah. And I, and I was worried when I was going around there because obviously I see these folks. They actually keep spare capacity just in case mm -hmm. uh, an order comes in. And I was saying to them, well, why would you be wholly reliant? Even if you went to other rail customers, you know, th th there's an opportunity within the rail sector at the moment, both in the UK, HS2, and many other places as well in Europe. And I must admit, uh, the it's because they've been so focused on the knitting it's back to what steve was saying it's operations but not strategy and part of that strategy is to say look we can't have all eggs in one basket that that's not a bad it's not a good uh, way my when i was going around i was trying to talk them into and even introduce them into people higher up the line who they perhaps didn't know of so that they can try and expand the network a bit okay thank you right that's um that's great, Sai. Thank you very much for the presentation. I think we're going to run into the uh, manufacturing support services video. If you can run that for me, please. We can deliver value to businesses quickly. Working with clients, strength their businesses. Using their challenges and the technology that's right for them. £50 million pounds worth of the latest manufacturing technology. Fresh thinking that you could not access any other way. Doing things out of the ordinary is not out of the ordinary for us. Working with the MTC has been fantastic. I believe this is a smart approach to business. We've turned over 30% more orders. We actually haven't employed anybody else. We've managed to double our turnover in a period of two years without increasing our overhead costs. We focus on helping great British manufacturing get even better. Okay, and uh, following on from this, we've got a programme uh, of other webinars. Uh, the next one, I believe, is on uh, COVID um, 
or maintaining productivity in a COVID environment. Uh, on the 23rd of June, on the 30th of June, uh, we're running a webinar on robotics and automation, practical and affordable steps. So please join us for that. Um, if you've got any, any concerns about your business, we, we, you know, you can book a, um, a 30 minute conference call with us and we'll discuss what the challenges are. Um, and the MTC is, uh, with REACH funding, always ready to support, uh, particularly, you know, the SMEs of this world. Uh, and uh, we understand you, the challenges that we, you're facing at the moment. So we're here, we're here to help. And um, if you do want the supply chain uh, assessment, uh, we can run that uh, free of charge. So if you want to use a SCRL tool, um, please um, get in touch. Thank you very much for listening today. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.